<laughs> Hi guys, welcome to episode four of season three of Tiny Tips with Tip, where I teach you skills in the NICU. So in this last episode of season three, I just wanted to share with you guys some of the common diagnosis you'll see in the NICU. So I just wanna share with you guys some of the common diagnosis. I'm not gonna go too much into detail about each one just because that is going to be such a super long video. So I just wanted to share with you guys some of the very common ones that I see very often in the NICU and a lot of reasons why patients are admitted to NICU and for that reason. And so here are some of the ones that you're gonna see most often. So the very first one, of course, is prematurity. A lot of times babies come into NICU just because they're born early. Um, and so we have some patients, the smallest and the youngest patient that I've had was a 22 weeker and probably weighing around like 400 something grams. And so that's probably the smallest patient that I had. And obviously our patients um, are here, can be here for long periods of time. So we've had patients stay for a, quite a few months. Um, the longest patient we had was a year. So that's of course corrected age. And so if your patient was born at 22 weeks, try to imagine uh, what a year looks like for this patient. So. A lot of times patients get admitted to NICU for that reason, whatever mom's history is. And if patient has to be delivered early, then a lot of times they are having to be induced early and they come into our unit. Or a lot of times there's some patients that just wanna come early and they arrive early. And so they're coming to NICU for further monitoring and then we keep them here until they are able to go home. And so going home may be different for a lot of patients depending on what their diagnosis is, but for preemies at least, going home means that they're able to eat and feed on their own, and, and that can take some time, especially for these babies. They're not supposed to be born early, so they have to learn a lot of skills in order to get there, and getting them to full feeds and bottle feeding on their own may take some time, and so that's usually one of the reasons why they're here in the NICU. And so going alongside with that too, prematurity can come with a lot of other things that requires them to be in the NICU for a long time. So being born small means that there's a lot of things that can go wrong or can happen. And one of those things being IVH, so intraventricular hemorrhage. So in the NICU, a lot of times with our babies, something we really monitor for is for IVH. And basically what that means is we check to see if there's brain bleeds. When you're born premature and you're born early, you're at a very high risk for developing brain bleeds. And what that means is that depending on the pressure or the movement or anything that goes on during the delivery, that puts them at a very high risk for developing it. So we keep patients in the NICU to monitor for these brain bleeds. And there's some patients that can go out of it as they grow older and their brains have more room um, and expansion, then sometimes the brain bleeds can go away. And there are times where they need to be further monitored and we do have some patients that can go home with a shunt so it just really depends on the severity of the brain bleed but that is also another diagnosis that we monitor for patients who are born prematurely another thing also that goes alongside with prematurity as well is rop so rop stands for retinopathy of prematurity which basically means that their retinas are not fully formed so being preemie can be a sucky thing just because a lot of things are not fully developed such as, like I said, there can be issues with brain bleeds, your eyes are not fully developed. And so um, that's something we also monitor for too, that we check some of our patients for, is we monitor them with eye exams. And the eye exams really determines whether or not um, the patient's eyes are appropriate, they're growing, um, they're growing appropriately, and so we check and monitor their retinas to see if they're developing appropriately. And other risk factors for that too is also oxygen support. So if your patient is on oxygen support for a long time, then they can at be at risk for developing ROP. So it could be something that they are already born with. Being premature, you're at a very high risk, or it can be something that they develop further on because of being put on oxygen support for a very long period of time. Um, that they can also develop RP. So that's something that they can come into NICU for that we further monitor. And another thing also that comes along with being born early and being born premature is that you're at high risk for developing lung disease. So patients that are born early and being born premature, a lot of things are not fully developed, like I mentioned already, and lungs can be affected as one of them. And since they are born prematurely, that their lungs are not fully formed properly. And a lot of times our patients need a lot of extensive time frames being on oxygen support and so really when they're in the NICU a lot of times we have patients that can be here for a while that we're trying to slowly wean them off different types of oxygen support so we have patients that start off being intubated on a ventilator and then hopefully we get them off of that and then we put them on like a CPAP which is another type of oxygen support that is not as invasive so there's no tube but they do have oxygen that they get put on through a mask 
as well as prongs. And so that goes into their nose and gives them oxygen support. And then over time, we try to wean them off of that. And then we put them on a high flow, which is the most least invasive type of oxygen support that we give. It's just a little cannula that goes in their nose and they wear that for a period of time. And hopefully we slowly wean them off of that and then eventually get them to an area where they don't need oxygen support. So this can take a long period of time. This can take months sometimes. And so it's something that we monitor them in the NICU for that hopefully eventually over time we can get them off that type of oxygen support. But yeah, being born premature puts you at a lot of risk for things and so that's also one thing that we experience and see a lot in the NICU as well just having patients on different types of oxygen supports and hopefully getting them off it eventually. Other things that we see often too is patients coming in for RDS or TTN. So RDS stands for respiratory distress syndrome and TTN stands for transient tachypnea of the newborn. So with both of them, basically they just mean that they're having respiratory issues. With RDS that they're more it's more longer term than TTN. TTN is something more that it's through the birthing process that they just have excess fluid in their lungs and then we're just trying to get them out. And over a short period of time, we are able to hopefully get them off oxygen support and they can hopefully go home. So TTN is like a shorter period of time, whereas for RDS, respiratory distress syndrome, that can last for longer periods of time. Patients can be on oxygen support for quite a while. And so the differences between TTN and RDS is just like the period of time they're on oxygen support. TTN can maybe last for a few hours and a few days and then they're totally fine. And RDS is something that can be a few days, weeks, even months. So it just really depends. So we have to do diagnostic testing for both of them and check an x-ray to see whether or not it's TTN or RDS. So they can come out with different symptoms for both, but a lot of times what you're going to see the most is that they're having issues with breathing, difficulty breathing, work of breathing. So we do suctioning of their lungs to make sure to get any excess fluid out. We put them on oxygen support for a little bit and monitor them and see if hopefully they can recover very quickly or they might have to be on longer periods of time. So it just depends. Another thing patients come in for is a pneumo. So a pneumo is a pneumothorax, which basically means popping of the lungs. It's probably the easiest way I can explain it. We have some patients where their lungs just collapse due to any sort of pressure increase, birthing deliveries or whatever. We do have patients that kind of cause it on their own and where they'll just cry so much that they kind of collapse their own lung. So it really just depends situationally what occurs and how that pneumothorax occurs, but we have some patients that come in for that. So we may have to do needling. So what we do is our team will put in a needle and we will hopefully get fluid or any excess air out. And then hopefully it gives the lungs the ability to re-expand. So that is also something that patients come in for as well. The very most common one we also see a lot too is patients coming in for hypoglycemia. So if we have parents who are gestational diabetic or diabetic, we have a lot of times where the baby comes in and they're having glucose issues. What happens in utero if mom is diabetic that there's a very high increase of insulin and what happens is when the baby is born and the baby comes out they don't rely on mom anymore and they have glucose instability and their sugar levels are very very low so they come into the NICU and we of course start them on IV fluids we give them sugar water basically and we kind of hopefully help them get to a stabilized place with their sugar levels and so that may mean we have to check glucose levels every single hour, every three hours, every four hours, and eventually hopefully once a shift and then once a day. And hopefully their sugar levels stabilize once we give them increased fluids and hopefully they start eating more. And so a lot of times we have patients coming in for that too. Another very common thing that patients come in for is sepsis. So sepsis occurs because of infection and it can occur many different ways. So whether it's through exposure from mom, whether whatever her maternal history is, um, whether the baby was born and ruptured very early and so being exposed for a long period of time is at risk for infection and so we have patients coming in that we monitor for sepsis so really our goal is to bring the patients in we do a culture on them just to see whatever is growing then we start them on antibiotics and then hopefully the cultures come back negative or hopefully the patient starts to stabilize enough after a few days of being on antibiotics and then eventually we send them home. So it really just depends on what the birthing history is, but we also have patients who develop sepsis in the hospital for whatever reason too. And so we will keep them in the NICU for monitoring as well. And we also will give them medications for it. So another thing patients also come in for is for different types of cardiac defects. So we have patients who are born that we already know has cardiac defects, 
or we have patients that we later on discover that they have a cardiac defect when we do our assessments. So how we really determine and know for sure if it is a cardiac defect is we do an echocardiogram, which basically is a screening of the heart. And that really tells us specifically what kind of defect they have. And so we have a lot of patients coming in for that. And at my hospital, we do different types of cardiac surgeries. And so we have patients that we keep on our unit that we monitor so that way they can have their cardiac surgery. Another thing that a lot of patients come in for is for genetic reasons. So we have patients coming in for different types of genetic issues. Um, for example, one of them that's most common is the different types of trisomies. So trisomy 21 is the very most common one we see, which is Down syndrome. Um, we also have patients coming in for like neural, neural tube defects um, where they have meningocele, which is little sacs um, in the back of their spine. So that's another common one that we see often as well in the NICU. And so we really keep the patients here. We do a lot of monitoring for them as well, whatever their defect is, or if they do have trisomy, we try to do whatever we can to give them comfortable care and do lots of different diagnostic tests for them as well to rule out all sorts of different things. So we will keep patients in the NICU for that reason as well. And a lot of times patients can be stable enough that if they are diagnosed with a genetic issue that hopefully they are stable enough that all we really need to do is just keep them here for monitoring. Sometimes patients really just need to be in here to work on feedings. And so we will kind of monitor them for that. So I've had a lot of trisomy 21 patients where Really their main issue is just working on feeds and they just need to learn how to eat. And so they'll come in, we keep them for a while and help them with feedings. Another very common one we see as well also is jaundice. For some babies, um, whether it's in utero or um, post delivery, we notice that some patients can be a little bit yellow. And so we will do diagnostic testing by grabbing labs and we will check their bilirubin levels. And if the bilirubin levels are high, then that basically determines for us that we need to do treatment for, for them. And the most common thing that we do is we put them on phototherapy lights. So I don't know if you've ever been in a NICU or seen what a NICU is like, but we do have some patients that have these little blue lights. And it's funny because we'll tell the parents that the babies are basically tanning. And so we put little goggles on them to kind of cover their eyes to protect them from the light. But the light really helps to break down the bilirubin. But the very most important thing to help get rid of it is to have the patient eat a lot and poop a lot. So that's really the best way to get rid of the bilirubin. So we'll keep some of our babies in the NICU for a while. Um, hopefully when they start slowly waking up a little bit more and eating a little bit more and pooping. And then of course, keeping them under lights and being exposed as much as possible is what's going to help get rid of it. And so we have some patients coming into NICU for that as well. We also have some patients coming in for meconium aspiration. So in utero, sometimes there are babies that get too comfortable in there and they actually poop. So what happens is that the meconium ends up floating around in there and the baby actually swallows it. So when the baby is born, imagine having poop stuck inside your lungs and it's not just any ordinary poop. Meconium is a very sticky, very tarry type of poop. So imagine that getting stuck in your lungs. And so we have some patients that will come out with meconium aspiration syndrome and basically what we have to do is we have to intubate these babies and we have to suction as much of that poop out as much as we can. And so sometimes babies can come into NICU for that as well. So these are some of the very most common diagnosis that you'll see in the NICU. There's still plenty more on my list, but I don't wanna make this video too extremely long. And some of them are not as common compared to these ones that we see very, very often. So it's very nice in the NICU just because we deal with a very small group of diagnosis that we see very frequently. And that way we are able to critically think a lot faster because we notice these things all the time. So I think that's what really helped my critical thinking skills a lot in the NICU. After seeing these diagnoses over and over again and what signs and symptoms connect to them that I'm able to pick out things a lot faster. And so I'm really glad to be in a unit that does have such a small range of diagnosis just because it's a lot easier for me to pinpoint and pick out certain different things that may connect to the diagnosis my patient has. And a lot of times patients may not have something and then over time develop it. And so if you notice certain signs and symptoms, it can lead to a new diagnosis that we didn't even know about. So Hopefully this video is helpful for you guys to know the most common diagnosis we see in the NICU. I hope you guys enjoyed season three of the Tiny Tips with Tips series. And let me know down in the comments below if I should do a season four and what types of videos you wanna see for that season. And I'll see you guys in my next one. Bye.